In the open square of the old Norman city of Falaise in the year 1386, a vast and motley crowd had gathered to witness the execution of a criminal convicted of the crime of murder. Noblemen in armor, proud dames in velvet and feathers, priests in cassock and cowl, falconers with hawks upon their wrists, huntsmen with hounds in leash, aged men with their staves, withered hags with their baskets or reticules. Children of all ages and even babes in arms were among the spectators. The prisoner was dressed in a new suit of men's clothes and was attended by armed man on horseback, while the hangman before mounting the scaffold had provided himself with new gloves and a new rope. As the prisoner had caused the death of a child by mutilating the face and arms to such an extent as to cause a fatal hemorrhage, the town tribunal or local court had decreed that the head and legs of the prisoner should be mangled with a knife before the hanging. This was a medieval application of lex talianis, or an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. To impress a recollection of the scene upon the memories of the bystanders, an artist was employed to paint a fresco on the west wall of the transept of the Church of the Holy Trinity of Falaise, and for more than 400 years that picture could be seen and studied, until destroyed in 1820 by the carelessness of a whitewasher. The criminal was not a human being, but a sow, which had indulged in the evil propensity of eating infants on the street. Pigs tried for murder, rats banished for eating the barley crop, roosters found guilty of witchcraft. This isn't the lore of some old fairy tale. This shit was really happening, and quite regularly throughout medieval Europe. What follows are some truly kooky tales of medieval animals made to stand trial for their behavior. In modern times, laws involving dangerous animals tend to focus on the owner of an animal and their culpability in the animal's behavior. For example, if an ordinarily peaceful dog attacks a person, the person who was attacked could sue the dog owner for basic negligence. And if it's found that the owner was being negligent in their handling of the dog, they may be ordered to pay the injured party damages. However, if the dog had a known propensity to attack humans and the dog does attack someone, then negligence is presumed meaning the owner will be held strictly liable for the damages because they knew the dog was dangerous and did nothing. Similarly, if someone owns a wild animal like a tiger, they would be held strictly liable for any injuries that tiger causes because wild animals like tigers are inherently dangerous. However, as you'll hear in medieval Europe, it was much more common for animals to be brought before judge and jury and made to answer for their crimes. Medieval people appear to have given more weight to the mens rea or mental state of animals than we do today, therefore finding that animals can be found guilty of crimes, though the reasons why they held full-on trials for these animals are purely speculative, with one scholar stating, nobody knows what they were for and nobody has ever known. <laughs> it is thought to originate from Judeo-Christian interpretation of a section of the Bible known as Exodus, which dictated that oxen who attack people should be stoned to death. Also in Greek and Christian theology, it was thought that murder and other pestilence, whether by man, animal, insect, or object, could bring the fury of the devil or other evil gods to ruin the crops and rain terror upon the land, unless the guilty be made to answer for their actions. If the devil is in disguise as a rooster, for example, and is permitted to go unpunished, that gives the devil the opportunity to then take possession of other people and things and places. So in honor of this absolutely kooky practice, and because I find it fascinating, I bring you an assortment of tales of medieval animals on trial. Our earliest tale takes place in the year 864 in the Holy Roman Empire. The crime, murder. The accused, a swarm of bees. In the Middle Ages, it was common for religious tribunals to try rats, mice, and insects for their crimes of ravaging crops and other malicious deeds. Because swarms of insects were impossible to physically bring to trial and punish for their crimes, you try arresting and mirandizing 800 bees, churches often turned to more metaphysical aid in the form of curses, conjuring, excommunication, and exorcism. The devil is in the insects. You know what I mean? In this tale, the bees were put on trial in the year 864 before the Council of Worms. Yes, the Council of Worms. I know this is confusing. The Council of Worms wasn't actually made up of worms, even though we are talking about bugs, insects, and other creepy crawlies, okay? Worms is, in fact, a city in Germany. The Council of Worms was trying the bees for murder because they stung a man to death. They were found guilty of their crime and sentenced to death themselves. Apparently, a hive of bees is a bit less unwieldy than a field full of locusts, for example, so they were easily dealt with 
via the death penalty. They were suffocated in their hive before they could make any more honey, lest the honey be tainted by the devil. In medieval France, pigs were seen as pets thanks to Saint Anthony the Great, the patron saint of pigs, so they would be allowed to roam the city scavenging for food. Unfortunately, these pigs could get a bit aggressive when it came to food, and because of how commonly they roamed the streets, pigs tended to be most often put on trial. In 1379 France, two herds of pigs came together, one owned by the community at large and one herd owned by the local friar. A piglet was amongst the group, and it started squealing wildly, as piglets do. This absolutely pissed off three of the sows in the group, who got so agitated that they rammed into the son of the swine herd, killing him. Those three sows were found guilty of murder and condemned to death. However, all the other pigs in the herds were found to be accomplices to the three murderous sows, and they were sentenced to death as well. It was said that, as both the herds had hastened to the scene of the murder and by their cries and aggressive actions showed that they approved of the assault, they were arrested as accomplices and sentenced by the court to suffer the same penalty. They were found accomplices to murder because they squealed in delight, which made it seem like they were egging on the other pigs. However, the friar who owned one of the herds begged the Duke of Burgundy to have the herds pardoned, and all but the three murderous sows were spared in the end. In 1457, a pig and her six piglets were involved in the gruesome murder of a five-year-old boy, and they were caught in the act covered in his blood. After all seven were caught, they were imprisoned awaiting trial. At the trial, the owner of the pigs was not punished for the murder. The pigs, however, faced the death penalty. The pigs stood trial and the judge took testimony and consulted with men knowledgeable in local law. The six piglets were charged as accomplices, but there lacked any positive proof that the piglets assisted with the murder and given their age, likely didn't understand the weight of their actions. The piglets were acquitted, but their mother was not so lucky. She was found guilty for murder and sentenced to be hung by her hind legs, as was the custom in Burgundy. In 1494, again in France, another pig was arrested for having strangled and defaced a young child in its cradle. A trial was held for the pig, during which time witness testimony was taken. It was said that on the morning of Easter day, as the father was guarding the cattle and his wife was absent in the village of Dizzy, the infant being left alone in its cradle, the said pig entered during the said time, the said house, and disfigured and ate the face and neck of the said child, which, in consequence of the bites and defacements inflicted by the said pig, departed this life. The pig was found guilty of the crimes. At sentencing, the judge said, We in detestation and horror of the said crime, and to the end that an example may be made and justice maintained, have said, judged, sentenced, pronounced, and appointed that the said porker, now detained as prisoner and confined in the said abbey, shall be by the master of high works hanged and strangled on a gibbet of wood. And while pigs were seemingly the most frequently prosecuted animals, others were not spared a similar fate. For example, in 1474 in Basel, Switzerland, a very unusual rooster was thought to be possessed by the devil and he was put on trial for witchcraft. This rooster, you see, laid eggs. This was considered a crime against the natural order of things because roosters are boys. You see, they're not supposed to lay eggs. The rooster was feared to be the spawn of Satan, and witches would use these eggs to cast spells and brew potions. The eggs were thought to hatch a mythical creature called a cockatrice, a two-legged dragon with a rooster head. So the existence of this danger sent the town of Basil into hysterics, and they arrested the rooster and charged it with witchcraft. The public defender argued strongly for the rooster's innocence, saying that no evil animus had been proved against against his client and that no injury to man or beast had resulted. Besides, the laying of the egg was an involuntary act and as such, not punishable by law. If it was intended to impute the crime of sorcery to his client, he was entitled to an acquittal for there was no instance on record of Satan having made a compact with one of the brute creation. The prosecutor countered with a biblical argument that it was not a case of the devil making a compact with brutes, but that Satan actually entered into them on occasion. The outcome of the trial is recorded in the Chronicles of Basil. In the month of August in the year 1474, a cock of this city 
was accused and convicted of the crime of laying eggs and was condemned to be burnt with one of his eggs in the Kublinburg or public square. That's right, they tied that rooster up with its eggs and burnt it at the stake in the town square while a crowd of people gathered around and watched. Science now tells us that this was likely a chicken with a hormone imbalance that caused it to grow the plumage of a rooster while still being able to produce eggs. RIP to that gender non-conforming king. In 1641 in Ireland, an uprising by Irish Catholics against English and Scottish Protestants led to an incident in County Mayo in which it was reported that rebels took cows belonging to English plantation owners and put them on trial. It was unclear what their offenses were. The rebels subjected the cattle to ancient English common law, and the procedure involved a literacy test. The accused were required to read from the Bible. The judge is reported as saying that the cows look as if they could speak English. Give them the book and see if they can read. Those dummies unfortunately stood mute and couldn't read at all, so they were sentenced to death. Nowadays, full-blown trials for animal misdoings are no longer in practice. This is likely due to a number of factors, including that we no longer live as closely with animals like pigs, and so we don't impart them with the human-like qualities of guilt and intent. We also no longer ascribe to the idea that punishing an animal makes an example of them and acts as a deterrent to future crime. Instead, we've shifted the blame to the owners of the animals, though it would be misplaced to assume that we've necessarily evolved in our treatment of animals, as is made clear by the frequency with which we kill animals who have disrupted the order and safety of humans, including animals held captive in circuses, zoos, and within our own homes. This video was inspired by the new book, Guilty Pigs, The Weird and Wonderful History of Animal Law by Katie Barnett and Jeremy Gans, and by a suggestion from my pal Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. If you'd like to get involved with choosing what appears next on this channel, or would like to connect with me and get behind the scenes content, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Your support is greatly appreciated and allows me to continue to bring you entertaining and educational content week after week. If you enjoyed this video, you might like my video from last week where I talk about the trial of Socrates. If you found this video informational or entertaining, please hit that like button and consider subscribing to hear more from me. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Goodbye.